implemented by our very own naturalists, including myself. So I personally am based in A.D. Barnes Park. Before we begin this presentation, I'd like to conduct a quick poll. It should take a few seconds. So be sure to scroll all the way down. You all should be able to just use your mouse and choose an, a response right on your screen. All right, I'll give another 30 seconds. Well, I believe that's it. All right, thank you so much everyone for participating in this poll. Now let us begin. Before we go in depth with everything, let's provide an overview on what this presentation is gonna cover. So in order to best explain why exactly feral cats would be classified as an invasive species to Florida, it's important to clearly define what native, non-native, and invasive species are. Following a small talk on the feral cat itself, there will be an explanation on their impacts on our ecosystem. So how exactly are they posing a threat to our native wildlife? Then we'll rewind a bit and talk about how exactly they came about. So when were they domesticated? How did they get here? Those, those questions will be answered. After that, we'll talk about contributing factors. So what exactly is perpetuating this vicious cycle of the invasiveness of feral cats? What's ne not necessarily helping the issue? Then we'll talk about what solutions we've been taking now and whether or not they've been working. And after that, we'll talk about some further solutions that we can suggest. All right, here we go. So what exactly is a native species? A native species is one that exists in an ecosystem as a result of solely natural processes. What exactly does that mean? So there was no human intervention involved in their presence in this ecosystem. So they were here before humans had a chance to do something to affect their prevalence or lack thereof. So in order to fully describe native, non-native and invasive species, we would need some sort of quantifier. So it's, it doesn't suffice to say that they're just native. Where are they native to? Are they native to Florida? Are they native to Colorado, to Washington state? So that would be that quantifier. Some examples of Florida native species are the raccoon on the left image. We have the Florida alligator, as well as the gray fox to the right, and the beautyberry, a native plant species. And what is a non-native species? It's one that's released intentionally or accidentally outside of their native range and into a new region. In other words, humans somehow brought them there. Whether it was deliberate or whether it was by accident, they were brought there they were not really here to begin with. There are around 500 non-native Florida species. Not all of them pose a threat to the environment. So an example of this would be the key lime or other citrus trees. They're not necessarily native to Florida. They were brought by Spanish settlers, but they don't necessarily pose a threat. But when they do, when they do pose some sort of economic or environmental threat to human plant or animal health, then they will be classified as invasive species. All invasive species are non-native, but not all non-native are necessarily invasive. In these examples we have here, they, these are all invasive species. We have the Burmese python as the first image from the left. Following that is the iguana, and above it is the lionfish 
for which there's a presentation on. To the right is the oyster plant and under that is the Brazilian pepper. Now let's go into the topic of the presentation, cats. By cats, I'm referring to the domestic cat. So your everyday average house cat. What exactly makes it feral? What makes it feral is when it's not owned, when it exists in the wild. But not only that, it would need to have little contact with humans, little to no contact. So that would distinguish a feral cat from let's say a stray cat. So a stray cat is one that is socialized to be with humans. So for most of its life, it was around humans. It interacted with humans, but maybe something happened. Maybe it was abandoned or something. That would make it a stray cat. Now say this stray cat has a litter of kittens. Those kittens, if they continue to grow up in the wild, they would be considered feral cats. Now, according to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation, there are around 85 million pet cats in the US. Half of those are outdoors, 43 million of those 85. And not only that, but in addition to those 85 million, there's another 60 to 100 million that are stray or feral. So why exactly are feral cats invasive to Florida? Well, first of all, they're not native. They were brought here by humans. The only native species that we have that would fall, that are, um, would be considered native cats of sorts would be the Florida bobcat and the Florida panther. So the bobcat is on the image to the left and the panther is on the image to the right. So there's a stigma that is associated with cats that makes it difficult for us to really want to classify them as invasive because we have this association with them as our lifelong companions since they're such a common household pet. But the short answer to this question as to why they're invasive is that they pose a threat to our native wildlife. But we're not here for the short answer. We're here for a more in-depth explanation. Now, why exactly are they invasive? First of all, they hunt and kill even when they're well fed. So feral cats, they have plentiful resources provided for them. Not necessarily directly in all cases, but they do have food sources for them wherever they are. So cat colonies, they tend to go to where open containers of edible garbage are. So these cats, despite the fact that they have this food for them, they still have this innate instinct to hunt and kill. Now, as for natural predators, whenever there's a scarcity of food supplies, they have two choices. What they can do is one, go to another habitat in order to find other food sources, or, they can eat something else in that same habitat. So cats don't necessarily need to do that because they have plenty of food for them. So they don't need to worry about a scarcity of resources, which is why they would continue to hunt and kill their, their same prey, regardless of whether or not that population is declining. So feral cats are predators to animals such as rabbits, squirrels, mice, lizards, snakes, and birds. And there was a study conducted by Pamela Jo Hadley of Florida State University in 2003 that stated that cats kill an estimated 271 million small mammals and 68 million birds per year in Florida, only in Florida. So they kill almost 70 million birds in Florida if we were to look at the bigger picture at the US, then that would be an estimated few billion. A lot of these are endangered species, such as this little fella to our right. We have a lower keys marsh rabbit in this image. Now, uh, it, this one is endemic to the lower keys, meaning that it's only located in the lower keys. When I read this study, it stated that there were only around 300, but mind you, this study was in 2003. So I looked at the statistics now and it said that there are only around 150 individuals remaining. As for the question as to whether or not it's actually cats that are affecting this population, the answer would be yes. It's very likely that cats are one of the biggest threats to marsh, these marsh rabbits. There was a study conducted by Forrest and Humphrey in 1996 that stated that the persistence of the population of lower key marsh rabbits were predicted to be extended to 50 years if all predation by cats was removed meaning that cats are a significant threat to these lower keys marsh rabbits. So just to connect all of us to this, bird watching is a wonderful pastime. 
So being based at 80 Barnes, I can say that 80 Barnes is known for its bird watching. Now, bird watching would prove to be a more difficult task if feral cats were to gather in that specific area because they pose such a threat to these birds because they hunt and kill. So if they're hunting and killing these birds, then that's reducing the population in the bird watching areas, meaning that it would be a much rarer encounter of these birds. But not only are they killing these birds, but they're also indirectly affecting natural predators, such as birds of prey. So as I stated earlier, these birds have the option whenever there's a scarcity of food supply, they can eat something else or they can go somewhere else. Now these birds of prey tend to go somewhere else. So like Cooper's hawks and owls because their food supply is reduced. So in order to survive, they would have to make that choice. So by depleting their food sources, cats are driving away these natural predators that would be more common to see otherwise. Now, there was another study conducted by Christine Stracy of University of Florida's Cultural Plaza in, in Florida's Museum of Natural History. And she stated that cats are the number one predator of urban mockingbird nests and that they accounted for over 70% of urban attacks on mockingbird nests. Mockingbirds are the state bird. So that's one of the examples of the threat that cats are posing to these species. Now, another thing is that cats are the primary transmitters of a disease called toxoplasmosis. This comes from a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. Now, this infects warm-blooded animals. So unfortunately, humans would also be at risk of this. As a matter of fact, there's a study that, estim that estimated that there's around 60 million people infected with toxoplasmosis in the US. Now, a lot of these people would be asymptomatic. So they may be a carrier, but they wouldn't necessarily demonstrate the symptoms. The symptoms of toxoplasmosis, if they are exhibited, are fever, loss of appetite, lethargy, and pneumonia if the parasite happens to be in the lungs. So here's a diagram. Now, if the cat ingests raw meat or some infected prey, then the parasite ends up in their body. Now that parasite, what it does is that it produces these eggs called oocysts. And oocysts ultimately are released through the cat's feces. So as we all know, cats poop a lot. Now there are studies that show that there's around 2.6 billion pounds of cat feces produced in the US per year. So much, many of these feces have oocysts on them, which puts not only humans, but wildlife in danger. When these wildlife ingest something that happens to contain oocysts, then the parasite ends up in their body as well. And then it could become cysts in the brain, liver, and muscle tissue. Now, this is detrimental to their health and can even cause death. So another not so fun fact about the invasiveness of cats is that if you're into farming, feral cats would become a nuisance because they have a tendency to kill poultry. And not only that, but they have a tendency to defecate in gardens and dig. So, they're, so with their feces, they're exposing any farm animals to that toxoplasmosis. Not only that, but the digging itself could damage crops. So let's rewind a bit. When exactly did this begin? How did this happen? How did they get here? So they, so they were domesticated in Egypt. It, there's evidence found in 4,000 year old Egyptian art. There's other evidence found in 10,000 year old engravings from the stone age. And then more recently, some remains were found in the island of Cyprus in a 9,500 year old grave site. So this was buried with seashells and artifacts. And because these remains happen to be part of those sediments, that's good evidence that they were around that time. However, there is no clear cut answer as to when cats were domesticated because domestication is such a complicated process. There was no fine point when humans decided that they hereby declare this animal domesticated because it's such a gradual process. So if you wanted to know more about the process itself, 
then I highly recommend this book called Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. They, he talks about human society as a whole, but he goes through great detail when it comes to domestication. And this isn't only domestication of animals. This also happens to be a domestication of crops. So what exactly made crops that were originally poisonous edible? It's a great book. I highly recommend it. So how exactly did they get to North America? Well, that's a simple answer. That's through European settlers. So by the time European settlers got here, cats were already a common household pet for them. So that's how they came about here. So let's look at the population growth of cats. Mind you, this graph represents the population growth of house cats. However, that doesn't undermine really the, the threat that feral cats would pose because house cats many a time roam. And when they roam and they're not neutered, then that's fair game for the cat to, ooh, I'm sorry. That's fair game for the cat to mate with another cat and reproduce. And mind you, those cats that are reproduced, a lot of the time, they're born in the wild. So they end up being feral cats. If we look at 1970, we have around 30 million cats. Then around 2010, we have over 90 million cats. That's a huge change. Now let's analyze that. So let's look at the curve that's to the right. This is what's known as a logistic curve, which is also known as a population growth curve. Now this is common for anything that grows as a population. So this is common for cats, this is common for humans, this is common for any sort of animal. Now, first, that rate of change is exponential. So let's say from the beginning, from point A to point B, it's not growing that much, but then if you go a little bit later, like towards the middle of the graph, then from point A to point B, that rate of change is very steep, meaning that the rate of growth is very high. So just for some perspective, it's very similar to the way that viruses spread because the more people who are infected, the more people can get infected. So the more that cats reproduce, the more we have kittens who eventually can reproduce themselves. And that's how it's an exponential rate of change. But then it reaches this threshold that's a carrying capacity of the environment. Now, what exactly does that mean? That's when there's a scarcity of resources. So that's when it's becoming more difficult to reproduce and survive because there just aren't enough resources for that population to grow much more than it already is. And where exactly are feral cats in this? Well, they would be still in the exponential phase because they don't necessarily have a scarcity of resources. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of food and a lot of shelter provided to them. So they're not really threatened that much by that carrying capacity yet. So what are some contributing factors to this? What exactly is doing the opposite of helping the situation? Despite the fact that this is very well-meaning, feeding stray cats is one of them for several reasons. So we're providing a food source for these feral cats, meaning that they can continue to survive and still kill at their leisure and not have to worry about killing really to survive. So they have this food for them. And not only that, but cats, feral cats tend to be fed in areas such as parks. Now these parks, we don't know if maybe they're good for bird watching or something. Maybe they have nature preserves where there's na native wildlife. So we would be bringing those cats there if we're feeding them because feeding stray cats in a target area, that brings other cats in. So that is known as cat immigration. So let's say that someone is feeding cats in a specific park. Now that park is gonna continue to get more cats from surrounding areas over, over there because a food source is being provided to them. So that's a food source for cats to come and colonize at. Not only is it where the cats are being fed or how much the cat is being fed, but it's also what the cat is being fed. So what exactly are feral cats being fed? The answer to that is cat food. 
So cats have very specific needs. So there's a study, Nguyen and colleagues in 2017, that states that cat food is high in sodium. Why exactly is it high in sodium? Well, it's to prevent kidney stones. How exactly? That is to uh, encourage more water intake and more urine production. So the more that cats drink water and the more that they let it out, then that's less of a risk for them to develop kidney stones. Now, this is a very cat-specific need. That is why cats have their own cat food. That is why dogs have dog food, which varies by breed anyway, and humans have human food and so on. So cats aren't the only ones eating this food when they're being fed at these places. There's also native wildlife that comes and eats this food. So this food may lack the nutrition that this specific species may need, like let's say a raccoon. A raccoon has specific needs for itself. Cat food doesn't necessarily provide that nutrition for them. However, they'll come and they'll see the cat food and eat it because it's there for them. But there are a few things happening here. So they're not necessarily getting the nutrition they need. They may be getting too much sodium because that's a cat need, not necessarily a raccoon need. But they're also filling themselves up with that. So they don't feel that need to eat anything else for the day. So they're not getting that nutrition, that daily nutrition that they need. And if they even survive after that, regardless, they're growing dependent on this food. So if one day this food happens to disappear, then they won't remember how to sustain themselves. So it'll be difficult for them to get their own food. So they grow dependent on that. So another fact is that in these places where feral cats are fed, they don't necessarily have natural predators. Once in a while, you'll hear stories of pythons eating cats or alligators eating them, but that's not their primary food source. So cats don't necessarily have that natural predator to help balance that population. Not only that, but cats don't really have competition for resources. And last but not least, they have, uh, there's the issue where cats are not neutered or spayed. So we'll go into that. What exactly have we been doing to help? Well, these methods are both highly debated. The first one is the trap and kill method. So basically cats are trapped and then they're taken to get euthanized. By many, this is considered inhumane. Miami-Dade County's animal services strives for a no-kill mission and they have achieved the no-kill status since 2015. In 2015, all the animals that they took in, 90% uh, of them were saved. So there's an alternative that the county is striving for, which is the trap, neuter, and release program, or the trap, neuter, and return program. Basically what it is, is that cats are, feral cats are trapped, they're taken to a participating veterinarian where they are neutered or spayed and vaccinated for rabies. Their ears are tipped, just like in this photo here, if you notice the cat's left ear or our right, the ear kind of has the tip off. That's to indicate that it's neutered or spayed. So once they do that, those cats are taken back to where they were and released. Now, the controversy with that is that cats are being released back into the wild where they're posing a threat to this wildlife. However, the upside to it is that the cat population would be reduced gradually because we're reducing that instance of breeding cats. So there's a lot of controversy with these two. Now, who exactly can TNR? The answer to that is any resident of Miami-Dade County. And as a matter of fact, the county website provides resources on that, which are all here. So we have tips and requirements. We have free neuter sites. Renting a trap, you can rent a trap from the county. It's a $50 refundable deposit. Once you, so they provide it for 10 days. If you can give it back within those 10 days, then you'll get those $50 back. And if you'd like more details on the animal services no-kill mission, it's the last link here. Now, is TNR working? The short answer to that is sort of, but, it's actually a little more complicated than that. 
So this is a study conducted by Benjamin Taylor, an undergraduate student of University of South Florida. And he created this mathematical model that would project the population growth of cats depending on how many cats are neutered per week. So the red dots here represent the case that 100 cats are neutered per week. That population growth is still pretty exponential. It's growing at a quick rate. However, let's look at the yellow dots. That's the case where 200 cats are neutered and spayed per week. So that's a much better outlook. But if we look at the blue dots, that's when 370 cats are spayed and neutered per week. So that shows a more steady population. And that is the goal we're trying to reach. There was another study conducted by Rachel Chrysler and colleagues. So the findings were published in 2019. However, the study was conducted from 1999 to 2013. So there was a TNR program in the Ocean Reef community at Key Largo that started in 1999. So she and her colleagues wanted to survey to see if that population was going to decrease over the years. And it turns out that population did in fact decrease over the years with the TNR program. So it started off at around 455 cats, then ended at around 206 by 2013. So it shows a positive correlation between the TNR program and the decrease in cat, feral cat population. However, there is a limitation to this. So just because there is a correlation, that doesn't necessarily imply that there's some sort of cause, so to, some sort of causal relationship because there are other extraneous factors that could be taken into account, such as maybe some sort of disease was introduced, maybe there were more adoption efforts within these years. So even though there was a correlation demonstrated, that doesn't necessarily imply causation. Now there are also some studies showing that there isn't necessarily a decrease in cat population with the TNR programs. So Castillo and Clark, conducted a study in 2003 where they surveyed two Miami-Dade County parks from 1999 to 2001. They found that there was an increase of 27 cats in one park and 61 in another. So once again, this doesn't necessarily mean they can conclude that TNR is certainly not doing anything for that same reason that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. So there could have been maybe the introduction of some individuals in the neighborhood who started feeding feral cats and thus causing some sort of cat immigration. So there was another study conducted by Foley and colleagues in 2005 where they surveyed San Diego and Alachua counties. And they concluded that there would need to be a 71 to a 94% TNR rate for population to steadily decline, which is a big number. So does that necessarily mean that it's working alone? Not necessarily. However, maybe we can do something else with that. So the best thing that would probably work would be education. What we can do is we can educate the community to neuter and spay their cats. So neutering and spaying their cats would reduce, well, it would eliminate the possibility of more cats being reproduced with respect to that one cat that's neutered and spayed. So if this individual effort were to become a collective, then we can strive to reduce that population of feral cats. Perhaps we can educate others about TNR. So the more people who are educated about TNR, the more people will be more enthusiastic about participating in a program and thus more steadily reducing that feral cat population. What else can we do? We can address the roots of the problem. That's actually probably the most scalable solution. And I'll explain that in the next couple slides or the next slide. We can educate individuals to not necessarily let their cats roam because that would pose a threat to the wildlife around. We can also educate people to not dump their cats, to not abandon, their, to find other alternatives. And also going back to a point I made towards the beginning of the presentation, we can educate individuals on eliminating open containers of edible garbage. So what cats do is that when they see these open containers, they don't necessarily see it as food that they can have, but they can see it as food that they can protect so that other cats can come and colonize with them so they can have their community. So if we were to reduce these, we can reduce sources of cat colonization. 
Now, what exactly did I mean by scalable solutions? Well, in this presentation, we've been looking in a microscopic lens. We've been looking at cats. However, let's look at the bigger picture. Let's look at invasive species in general. That's what this presentation is about, invasive species with a focus on cats. So we can use our pattern recognition, see what's the similarity between all these invasive species. Most of them actually have come as exotic pets. That's how they first started. They came as exotic pets and were somehow released. And then they happen to thrive in this climate. They had the resources provided to them. They don't necessarily have natural predators here. And there's not much competition for this, these resources for them. So if we can educate the community about these facts about invasive species, then we could take more preventative measures before they even start. So what are some positive results of taking such action? When it comes to any invasive species, long story short, we can eliminate threats to our native ecosystems, whether it's an invasive plant or invasive animal, we're saving native flora and fauna. And when it comes to cats, to feral cats, we can have better bird watching experiences because we'd be increasing that biodiversity once again. We can have these birds reproducing again, and thus more na natural predators coming to and balancing everything. And also as for cats, we would be reducing that risk of them being in the streets. I'm sure we've all had that scare where we've seen cats in the street crossing the road. Chances are that cat is probably feral or that cat is stray. So if we were to help address these issues, then we would be reducing that risk of them being out in the streets and being in danger. So another thing is that we can reduce instances of toxoplasmosis since they are the primary transmitters of it. And last but not least, we would have a better universal understanding of animal care. So if we can find alternatives to abandoning cats, you know, instead of doing that, maybe doing other things, we would have a better understanding of that. And we would also have a better understanding of invasive species. So it's the same reason that we take history classes. We learn from the past. We learn from past mistakes and make better decisions for the future. All right, and that concludes my presentation. So I'm gonna conduct this poll once again. All right, thank you so much everyone for participating in this. Now we're gonna go over the questions. So number one, how many birds have cats been estimated to kill in Florida per year? The answer to that would be D, 65 to 70 million. So once again, that study by Hatley stated that there are around 68 million birds killed per year by feral cats. Number two, cats drive birds of prey away from their ecosystem primarily by the answer to that would be A, depleting their source of food. So once again, these birds of prey have the choice of either finding some other food source in that habitat or going to some other habitat to find better sources of food. Number three, cat food is high in blank, which can potentially be harmful to wildlife that consumes it. The answer to that would be D, sodium. Once again, it's to prevent the production of kidney stones in cats. Number four, true or false? TNR programs are the only solution to reducing the feral cat population. The answer to that is false. So TNR and trap and kill are both controversial in some sense, but maybe working in tandem with some other solution would help.
All right, and that concludes my presentation. Once again, my name is Nick. If you have any questions and can't ask them here, my email is nicholas.nunez2 at miami.myday.gov. Feel free to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handles are Miami Dade Sea Grant and Miami Eco Adventures. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, thank you very much, Nick. It's now just after 5.30, so if you have to leave, that's perfectly fine. We'll be staying on to answer questions from the chat at this time. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and the link to the broadcast will be sent out in the next day or two. Please complete the webinar evaluation. The link is in the chat box and we hope that you'll join us next week. Please stay safe and well. And Nick, please turn your camera on so you can converse with your participants as you address their questions. All right. All right, do we have any questions from the group? Nick did a fabulous job. Thank you. All right, well, if that's Thank you, that, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and conclude this webinar and hope that we see you all next week. Oh, wait, wait, there is a question from Gabrielle. How can we help with this issue from home? So, from home, my favorite option is educate the community. So friends and family, I promise you that will branch out. Word of mouth is the most powerful thing. I highly recommend it. And also, um, yeah, I mean, just when it comes to any effort and just spreading that around something like this and have better conservation efforts. So. I think that's how you can help from home. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Great question, Gabrielle. All right. Everyone give a virtual round of applause for Nick. And this was his first conservation conversation. So we're really thrilled that he has passed his inaugural test. <laughs> Thank you, we look Anna. Forward to having him again. All right, everyone, please follow us on social media. And if you would like to receive an email informing you of the week's topic, please just indicate so in the chat box. And I will also put my email in the chat box. So that way you can shoot me an email directly and I'll add you to a list that I keep specifically for that purpose. Richard, I've already got you. Marsha, I've already got you. All right. Well, I wish everyone a wonderful weekend. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. You bet, Gabrielle. I'll add you to that list as well. All right.